one of the hostages, and James Foley, another one of the hostages, at least them, and possibly some others, they all converted to Islam. The Jordanian pilot was already a Muslim. So why are they killing other Muslims? Because you, Spencer, you Islamophobe, you ought to know that chapter 4, verse 92 of the Quran says that a Muslim must not kill another Muslim. So therefore, because they're killing other Muslims, they must not be Islamic, right? Well, no, not really. See, the uh, Islamic law has death penalty for apostates and heretics. And so these guys were fighting against the Islamic State, which they considered to be the caliphate, the only earthly government to which Muslims should properly give their loyalty. And so they figured these people have rendered themselves non-Muslim by fighting against the Islamic State. The Jordanian pilot, of course, was flying sorties over the Islamic State, so that makes him an enemy. Foley was in the army in Iraq. So there you go. It doesn't matter if they convert to Islam. That doesn't mean that you're, 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 all your sins are forgiven. That's Christian baptism. And I know that Islam and Christianity are identical, but unfortunately there are just a few details where they're not quite the same thing. And so even though they had converted to Islam, they couldn't be forgiven, and they had to be killed. What else do they do? We know that they have aroused the disgust and the horror of the world by kidnapping hundreds of women who were non-Muslims, Christians and Yazidis in Iraq, and pressing them into sex slavery. And people say, well, this is just 7th century barbarism. This is not anything that any civilized human being would ever countenance, and it couldn't possibly have something to do with one of the great Abrahamic religions, right? So let's go to the book. <laughs> Open your Qurans <laughs> to chapter 4, verse 3, and you will see, marry the women that seem good to you, two or three or four. If you fear that you will not be able to treat them justly, then marry only one. Or the captives of your right hand. What's a captive of your right hand? Slave. A slave. You are correct, sir. A captive of your right hand is, some, is a woman who is captured in battle. This is absolutely clear from another passage, 3350 for those of you who are keeping score, where Muhammad is told, O oh, Prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives, whose bridal dues you have paid, got to pay the dues, and the slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war. The slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war. Well, what are those women in, 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 in the Islamic State but slave girls they possess from among the prisoners of war? To make it absolutely clear, yet another passage, and I'm doing this, I understand that it might be tedious to do a little Quran study here tonight, but you have to understand that these things, when they're not just mentioned once, but mentioned twice, three times, four times in the Quran, and actually there are four passages having to do with sexual slavery of kidnapped, captured, infidel women, then you're talking about not something that you can say, well, there was some crazy verse, there are weird verses all over the Bible, you know, and therefore we shouldn't be concerned about this. But actually, this is something that is, that is important, that it's core, it's mainstream, it's mentioned four times in this book, which is shorter than the New Testament. The believers, this is chapter 23, beginning of chapter 3, 23, verses 1 to 6, the believers have, have attained, have indeed attained true success. And what is true success, you ask? Those who, in their prayers, humble themselves, sounds good, how, how very Judeo-Christian, to avoid whatever is vain and frivolous, who observe zakah, which is paying off. So right now, we're, all religions are the same, right? They essentially teach the same thing. Here we are. Who strictly guard their private parts, Pardon me, but this is what it says. Except from their wives, or from those whom their right hands possess. So we have it abundantly clear what these girls are for. Now you can say, yes, but see, this is a book that is subject to all kinds of interpretation. And that's why I brought this particular one along, so that we could get Maududi's interpretation of these passages. And so the first one I read about marrying the women who seem, who seem good to you, two or three or four, or the captives of your right hand, Maududi has a note on this. And remember, this is an internationally renowned Islamic scholar. You can find his books in any, Islam go to islamicbookstore.com. I'm sure you have an account there. And look for Maududi, you'll find him. 
20 of his books. He says that the captives of the right hand, he says this, this expression denotes slave girls, i.e. female captives of war, who are distributed by the state among individuals when no exchange of prisoners of war takes place. Isn't that what they did exactly? I mean, exactly? Remember, Maududi was in Pakistan. He died in 1979. He never heard of the Islamic State. He was not in Iraq or Syria. He was just reading the same book. Other people read it too. This is the problem. When the Jordanian pilot was burned alive in a cage, there were many, many, many articles that said, well, of course, this has nothing to do with Islam. That goes without saying. Because Muhammad said, do not punish with Allah's punishment the punishment of fire. In other words, Allah will cast us all into hell. He'll cast you all into hell for listening to me tonight. And he will burn you with fire there. But the human beings are not to burn people with fire. Got that? There's just a loophole, though. There always is. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 194. It says this. If someone has attacked you, attack him just as he attacked you. Now, those of you who are in the military can test. If you drop bombs on a place, things catch fire. If the Jordanian pilot is dropping bombs on the Islamic State, he burned things. And so they burned him. They attacked him in the same way they were attacked. QED. There you go. Another thing that they did when they got to Mosul, which was an ancient city in Iraq where there has been a Christian presence, a significant Christian presence, since the time of Christ, they painted the nun, which is the Arabic letter N. It looks like a, well, my kids call it the, the cyclops smiley because it's kind of a smile or a bowl with it, one dot over it, not two, like a smiley in English. It's, it, anyway, it's a nun. And the nun was painted on the doors of Christian homes. It means, it stands for Nasara, which is the Christian, the, Quran's word for Christians, Nazarenes. Why did they do this? They did this to mark the people in those homes for extortion or death. They did it in conjunction with a Quranic command. And Quran says in chapter 9, verse 29, fight those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, that is, the Jews and the Christians, until they pay the jizya, which is a tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the Islamic State went to these houses and they knocked on the door and they said, you have to pay the tax. The tax that is a hallmark of your submission to the rule of the Muslims. And these were Christians who had lived there and their families had lived there for centuries. And most recently they had lived under Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And Saddam Hussein was a terrible guy. But he did not rule according to Islamic law, and he granted relative equal rights to the Christians. The Christians were not paying a special tax for the privilege of having, not having their pl property plundered and the, having themselves get killed. They were living with almost relatively equal rights with the Muslims in Iraq. But when the Islamic State came in, they said, you have to pay the tax. It's the law. They refused to pay the tax. That made them kafir harbi, infidels at war with Islam, and they had to be killed, or they fled from the area to avoid being killed. And people say, well, you see, this has nothing to do with Islam, because they lived there for centuries under Islamic rule. Yes, they did, and they paid the tax. Then in the 1850s, Iraq was part of the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire under pressure from Western powers. In those days, there were Western powers. And they said, you have to stop persecuting the Christians. You have to abolish the jizya, the tax. And the Ottomans realized, because they were, as you may recall from history, the sick men of Europe, they realized if we do not abolish this tax, then we could end up with British and French troops in Ankara. And so we'll abolish the tax. Contrast that to when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan and installed constitutions under the aegis of the United States of America, in both of those countries that said Islamic law, Sharia, will be the highest law of the land, which means we were saying, go ahead and collect the jizya and subjugate the Christians and any other religious minorities who were around.
go ahead and take sex slaves who are captives of war and all that. Go ahead and do all that. It's the highest law of the land, and you do that. That's why I say in, the, in those days there were Western powers. You see the contrast. There's the famous story about the British commander who was approached not by a Muslim but by a Hindu. When the British went into India, the Hindus had a practice of sati, which was the wife who would be compelled to, or would voluntarily, throw herself onto the funeral pyre of her departed husband. And the British said, that's against the law, you're not going to do that anymore. The delegation of Hindus went to the British commander and they said, you have to understand this is our culture. And he said, fine, you go ahead and live according to your culture. We too have a culture. And our culture is that when men compel women to throw themselves onto a fire, we take those men and hang them by the neck until dead. <laughs> so you live out your culture and we'll live out ours. <laughs> Nowadays, we put in constitutions in Iraq and Afghanistan saying, go ahead and live out your culture, and we will not live out ours. We will not stand up for our own principles. And we will aid you and give you billions of dollars to enable you to live out yours. And this is because, of course, all cultures are the same. All religions are the same. They all teach the same things. And they're all equally good and equally beneficial for the human being individually and human society collectively. We all know that, right? So let's take another. What has the Islamic State been up to lately? Are they working on innovations to win themselves Nobel Prizes? <laughs> Have they discovered a cure for cancer? Have they built hospitals and schools? No, the Islamic State has been busy. They have gone into the museum in Mosul and taken sledgehammers to 3,000-year-old artifacts of the Assyrian culture. And they went into two ancient Assyrian cities, Nimrod and Hatta, and they did the same thing. They destroyed all these ancient archaeological works of art that had stood there for thousands of years. And people said, how savage, how barbaric, how terrible, and how totally un-Islamic. <laughs> because, of course, we all know that as soon as anything like this happens, we uh, know that our officials, who know so much about this, will take to the airwaves to assure us that it's not Islamic. And so this, too, is not Islamic. There's just one problem, and that is the Quran. The Quran says this. Many eras have passed before you. Many eras have passed before you. Go about them in the land and behold the end of those who rejected Allah, calling his directives lies. So what it's saying is, go around the world and look at the ruins of ancient cultures. And those ruins are a sign of Allah's judgment on these people because they rejected Islam. Mahenjo-daro is a very famous ancient archaeological site. It's in Pakistan. And there's been an ongoing controversy for years now about whether it should just be bulldozed and forgotten or whether it should be opened to archaeological exploration by Western archaeologists and open to tourism. And then somebody hit on a compromised position. He said, just put the Quran verse that I just read to you, chapter 3, verse 137. Many are the eras that passed before you. Go about the world and see the end of those who rejected Allah. Put that as a sign in front of the ruins at Mahento Dara. In other words, the only value that ancient archaeological artifacts have for hardcore Muslims, believers in the Quran, is as ruins. The only value they have is that they're rubble. And that the rubble shows that Allah will eventually punish all those who reject him. You see. So the, the, the ancient Assyrian artifacts, they were of no value to the Islamic State as such. But as rubble, they're of great value. So they had to make them into rubble. 
they had to create them as ruins. Because that is a sign that Allah has judged them. And so what you have here is a culture that loves destruction. That loves to ruin things. We saw it on 9-11. It wasn't just that they wanted to weaken the United States, but they wanted to do it by hitting at one of the foremost and iconic structures in the city of New York and in the United States as a whole. Because they're destroyers. Now see, this is a totally different mindset from that in the West. In the West, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, creation is valuable. And there's the idea of God as the creator of all things. Now, of course, Allah is supposed to be the creator of all things, but then he tells his followers to go around breaking them up again, destroying them. But in the Judeo-Christian view, God created all things and he created human beings and he made them in his image as creators who create things. And the things that human beings create, art and music and literature, are things that inspire the souls of other human beings to create and also to act in ways that are kind, generous, magnanimous, and good. And those things build up human societies. And this is why Western civilization is the greatest civilization on earth. Because these fundamental principles move people, form people, in ways that are good. And that make for life, creativity, prosperity. And then there are the destroyers. A lot, not long after 9-11, there was a uh, Taliban fighter interviewed on television. And uh, I think it was CNN, and he said that he was absolutely certain that if the United States invaded Afghanistan, that the Taliban would win. And the guy asked him why, and he said, the Americans love Pepsi-Cola. We love death. <laughs> Well, I've never had a drink of it, so I'm not sure. But the Americans love Pepsi-Cola, we love death, is actually a Quranic principle. I know Pepsi-Cola's not in the Quran, but the death part is. <laughs> tell them, there's a lot of tell thems in the Quran. You know, it's, it's oh, there you got a Pepsi-Cola, so you must be an American. The, uh, the, the, Quran is always Allah telling Muhammad to say things to the unbelievers. So tell them, O oh, you who are Jews, if you arrogantly fancy that you are Allah's favorites to the exclusion of all people, then wish for death if you are truthful in your claim. So saying, if, if, if you Jews say that you are God's chosen people, then you have to love death because that's what, according to the Quran, God's people will do. And then again and again we see this from Islamic jihadis. They say we will win because we love death more than you love life. Now loving death, consider that. It all starts to fit together. Loving death, loving destruction, <coughs> loving oppression, loving pain, This is something that is representing values that are absolutely contrary to the values not just of the Judeo-Christian West, but of anybody who loves life and values life as a gift. And anyone who understands that life is good, that creation is good, that to create things is good, that to love is good rather than to... And so we are truly in a battle for our very lives, not just in the sense that they will kill us if they can, but in the sense that life itself is being challenged. That it is life versus death. You either love life or you love death. Creation versus destruction. Love versus hatred. That's what this is about. And so... When we see the Islamic State, we see not only that they embody Islam, as I have explained here in this, that it's all in the Quran what they do, but also
also that they embody what may be the foremost evil force that the world has ever seen. The Soviet Union, you know, that was uh, the Cold War, and I'm sure that most of us here remember it very vividly, and how amazingly astonishing it was when the wall came down. And the Cold War, of course, went on for so many years because of mutual, the principle of mutually assured destruction. And the idea was that we have all sorts of nuclear weapons pointing at them, they have all sorts of nuclear weapons pointing at us, we don't want to die, they don't want to die, and so we're in a standoff, and we'll just look at each other eye to eye for 30 years until one of us blinks, and they blink, blinked. Mutually assured destruction does not work in this context. If you got people who love life, then they will not want to die. And so they will be willing to make various adjustments and even concessions or at least to negotiate a mutually acceptable settlement so that you can both go on and live in peace. But people who love death, they got nothing to lose. They want to get, they want to get there. The Boston Marathon bomber. You remember Jokar Tsarnaev, the Rolling Stone cover boy? He fled when he, after he'd run over his brother and killed him, and the police are chasing him, and he's running, and he goes into some guy's yard and into his boat, and he's found a marker, or he had it on him or something, I don't know, and he wrote on the inside of the boat, and he wrote that we see paradise in the barrels of your guns. In other words, go ahead and shoot us, because then we will go to paradise. Islam, in the beginning, was able to conquer a huge expanse of territory. Starting out, the Arabs, starting out in the 630s, they conquered all of the Middle East, all of North Africa, Persia, went into India. By 732, which is 100 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, they control from southern France all the way across North Africa, all the way across the Middle East, into Persia and into India. How did they do that? They did that because they created the most formidable formula for a warrior creed that has ever been developed. Chapter 8 of the Quran is called the spoils of war, al -Anfa, the spoils of war. And it dictates that if you go and you capture various material goods in battle and those captives of the right hand, you give 20% to Muhammad, and you can keep the rest. So you have an incentive. If you're some poor guy trying to eke out a living with some sort of a farm in the sands of Arabia, and then you hear that you can go and you can, if you, if you kill these guys, you can take all their stuff. You give away a fifth, but you got four fifths. Women, possessions, money, whatever. And if you lose, what happens? You go right to paradise, and in paradise there are 72 virgins ready to serve you. Non-alcoholic wine. It's actually, it could be alcoholic wine. The, the scholars differ on that. It says that it's wine flowing in streams by the couches on which the, the blessed are reclining. But it is uh, not intoxicating. So I guess it's kind of like a ghouls or something, or, you know, the uh, sparkling grape juice. But anyway, it's there. And so you've got a win-win situation. If you win, you enjoy the spoils of war. If you lose, you enjoy all the material comforts of paradise. The, 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 the paradise that you can imagine would be paradise for a young man in Arabia in the 7th century, he thinks, well, what do I want most? Girls, a lot of food, shade. It's a lot of talk about shade and cool breezes in paradise. Wine, sure, bring it on. And so you have no way to lose. And this created a warrior class that was 
unbeatable. And so they amassed this huge empire. I actually, Bruce mentioned, wrote a book, Did Muhammad Exist, a few years back. Uh, I won't go into all the details about why I don't think Muhammad was a historical figure. Uh, you can always read the book. But, uh, available at any self-respecting bookstore. But the point, um, the reason why I bring it up tonight is because there is no evidence that all of those conquests, in, at the time that they happened, nobody, there were a lot of people writing down what happened, particularly the conquered people. And nobody ever mentions Muhammad, or the Quran, or Islam, or calls the conquerors Muslims. Which is an extraordinary omission if Muhammad is supposed to have been the guy who actually energized, motivated, and inspired all this conquest. So anyway, the point is this, that what seems to be the case from the historical record is that the figure of Muhammad and the details of his life and the teachings of the Quran regarding warfare against unbelievers were created precisely in order to build that warrior group that would be unbeatable. In those days, there were two great powers before the advent of the Arab Empire. The Byzantine Empire, which was Christian, the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Persian Empire that was Zoroastrian. And I mentioned their religions because religion was what held those empires together. In those days, there weren't parliaments, there weren't constitutions. The thing that the empires of those days did in order to create unity among the people and preserve their domains was to mandate a common religion. This is why the early Christians were persecuted in the Roman Empire. Because they wouldn't pay, they wouldn't pay obeisance to the Roman gods, and the Roman gods were the glue of the state. If you didn't pay, if you didn't worship the same gods, then you weren't really a citizen of the state. So, by the time Muhammad and Islam come along, you have this Christian empire, you have a uh, Persian Zoroastrian empire, and they had actually slugged it out. They had fought a series of wars with each other in the early 700s, 600s rather, that uh, exhausted them both. And the area around Arabia, Syria, Egypt, all that was nominally part of the Byzantine Empire, but they didn't have enough troops to, to staff it anymore. These areas were wide open, right for the plucking, and the Arabs plucked them. And they took this huge area. But then, what did they need? They needed something to hold their empire together. So Islam was created as a result of that need. Now the point, the further point is that in doing that, you have a religion created by politicians and warriors in order to preserve and strengthen an empire. What kind of a religion would you, do, would you make up if you were in that position? One that was martial, violent, instilling the idea that it was a great thing to go out and fight and die for the state, which was the same thing as the religion, as the Islamic State keeps insisting of itself today. And so you have this warlike, violent creed that teaches these things. And throughout history, Muslims have acted upon them. There has never been a place ever in history since the advent of Islam where Muslims went and there were large numbers of non-Muslims and there wasn't conflict. Ever. Anywhere. There is not a place around the world today where there are Muslims and non-Muslims living together in large numbers. Large numbers is the key word here because of course in America we don't have this so much but it's coming. Where they non-Muslims and the Muslims live in peace. There is always conflict. There is always conflict because of the imperatives within Islam to fight against the unbelievers and to subjugate them. There is always conflict, and yet our leaders in the United States tell us it's going to be different here. The Muslims here are moderate, and they're more assimilated and wealthier than any Muslims ever have been in the Islamic world. And so anybody who has any concern about the fact that Barack Obama brought 300,000 Muslims into the United States last year alone is just a racist, bigoted Islamophobe. And yet, when we look at the Quran, the Quran is actually, this is the same Quran 
that Muslims read. It's written by a Muslim in order to aid Muslims who don't understand Arabic. It's got commentary by a Muslim in order to help those Muslims understand their religion. And it is the same Quran that is taught in every American mosque, in every American Islamic school, and the same Quran that's everywhere. There is not an American denomination of Islam that's different, like the Catholics and the Protestants. It's all the same Islam. So why do we think that it's going to be different here? It's not. And you can say, well, wait a minute. It is going to be different here because they're already here. And, and, and for the most part, we don't see this happening. Well, there are, as you may know, stages of development in the Quran. The Quran says a funny thing in chapter 2, verse 106. It says, when we abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten, we replace it with, with one that's just as good or better. So Allah reserves the right to cancel parts of the Quran and give you better ones. I mean, not now, but back then, when it was being written. Now, why would he do that? Of course, because in shifting circumstances, you have to change the teaching, and so you make up an excuse for changing the teaching from the immortal and immutable God. Now, why does that matter? Because in traditional Islamic theology, the violent passages of the Quran supersede and abrogate the peaceful ones. However, this doesn't mean, people have often asked me when I explain this, they say, well, wait a minute, then why don't they just take them out of the Quran if they're canceled? Because cancellation is relative. There are times in which they kick in. They just are not valid for all time in the same way the violent passages are. I understand this is a little bit abstruse. What I mean is this. The verses that are abrogated, they're peaceful. There are peaceful verses in the Quran. They're not really all that peaceful. But chapter 109 of the Quran says, for example, say to the unbelievers, I don't worship what you worship, and you don't worship what I worship, and basically let's leave each other alone. You have your religion and I have mine. Tolerance, at least. The problem is that later on in Muhammad's career, he starts teaching this violence and warfare, as I explained, quoted some of them. They slay the unbelievers, slay them wherever you find them, three times in the Quran. And so the passages that come later are considered to have precedence over the ones that come earlier. However, when Muslims are in the same situation that they were, that replicates the situation that Muhammad was in when he got the earlier passages, the tolerant passages, then the, the, the situation is the same. Those passages are once again in force. I, I don't mean to make this hard to follow. I'll try to make this very clear. That you have tolerance, and then you have the second stage, defensive warfare, and then you have the third stage, which is offensive warfare, jihad, to subjugate the unbelievers. When Muhammad got the tolerance verses, according to Islamic tradition, he was a leader of a small, weak group of people. They did not have military power. They did not have political power. And so he preached tolerance. It wasn't tolerance for everybody else. He was asking the powers to be tolerant to him. When the Muslims are also weak and do not have military power or political power, then they preach tolerance. In the United States, we see that now. As they grow in strength, then the other parts kick in. The defensive jihad and the offensive jihad. And we are already seeing it. We will see more and more of it. Ultimately, the objective is to subjugate the entire world under the rule of Islamic law. Once again, Barack Obama would tell me that I was a terrible person for saying this. And so let's go to the Quran. Maududi explains that verse, chapter 9, verse 29, that I mentioned before. Fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger, and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The Jews and Christians have to be subdued to submit to the hegemony of the Muslims. The word used, oops, sorry, wrong place. The purpose for which Muslims are required to fight is not, as one might think, to compel the unbelievers into embracing Islam. There's no forced conversion. You can still live as a Jew or a Christian or a Hindu or whatever. Rather, its purpose is to put an end to the suzerainty, the rule, of the unbelievers so that the latter are unable to rule over people. People, the latter, the unbelievers are not supposed to be able to rule over people. Not just the believers are not supposed to be able to rule over Israel or Iraq or Afghanistan or whatever, but just people in general. Unbelievers are not to rule. The authority to rule should only be vested in those who follow the true faith. 
Unbelievers who do not follow this true faith should live in a state of subordination. Anybody who becomes convinced of the truth of Islam may accept the faith of his or her own volition. The unbelievers are required to pay jizya, poll tax, in return for the security provided to them as the dhimmis, protected people of an Islamic state. Jizya symbolizes the submission of the unbelievers to the suzerainty of Islam. So that's what the Islamic State is about. And of course, finally, the most important piece of evidence that the Islamic State is very Islamic is the fact that over 20,000 Muslims from around the world have joined it. We never saw that with Al-Qaeda. We never saw that with any other jihad group. There have been several hundred Muslims from the United States, well over a thousand from France, a thousand from Britain, about 650 from Germany, 20,000 altogether. Now you understand this is within the context of people saying, oh, the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam. It's within the context of the American Muslim groups saying, we denounce the Islamic State, we condemn the Islamic State, all the Muslim groups have condemned the Islamic State. And yet, Muslims keep going there. And you've got to wonder, why is it that if they condemn the Islamic State, have they so signally failed to explain to their own young people why they should reject the Islamic State? If these Muslim groups reject the Islamic State, why is there not a single mosque or Islamic school in the United States or anywhere else in the world that has a program to teach young Muslims why they should reject the understanding of Islam represented by the Islamic State? There is no such program anywhere. Why? Condemnation is easy, but what we don't see is any action from the Muslim community against the Islamic State. And that is because they know full well the Islamic State is Islamic. When we see this steady stream of articles and steady stream of announcements from Obama and Kerry and everybody else that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, they have to keep telling us that because it's so obvious that it's false. It's just the big lie repeated over and over. And if you repeat it over and over, people will start to buy it. And so they keep pumping it out. The Islamic State has actually broken through the fog of disinformation they have kept up about this issue for decades. And so they have to pour on more dry ice to keep the fog thick. And the ultimate result of that will be that we are absolutely ignorant and complacent about the jihad threat. And if you think about the people you work with, maybe the people in your family, people you know around from whatever activities you're involved in, I'm sure you know that most Americans are ignorant and complacent about the jihad threat. And yet we have a mainstream media and a government that seems intent on keeping them ignorant and complacent about the jihad threat. I uh, won't speculate as to what the goals are. I, well, I, yeah, I will. <laughs> There's one thing I think, Barack Obama, you know, people always ask, Barack Obama, he's a Muslim, right? I don't know. He doesn't answer my emails, he doesn't return my calls. <laughs> but uh, Barack Obama certainly grew up a Muslim. He was registered as a Muslim in school. He even says in his first autobiography that uh, he was got in trouble for making faces in Quran class. Only the Muslim kids went to Quran class. He was a Muslim. He says he's not now. Okay, fair enough. The thing about Barack Obama, though, is that I think that he is, most of all, just a secular Marxist. And he thinks that if he gives the, Islamics, the, uh, the Islamic countries, not just the Islamic State, if he gives the Muslim world what it wants, then their grievances will be satisfied. See, there's a funny thing. In Islamic law, in Sunni Islam, which is 85 to 90 percent of all Muslims, only the caliph, the successor of Muhammad as the leader of all the Muslims, only the caliph has the authority to call offensive jihad, remember that third stage that I mentioned, the final stage of jihad warfare in the Quran. Only the caliph can, can call that. But there's been no caliph since 1924 when the secular Turkish government abolished the caliphate. There's one now over in Iraq, but nobody, uh, nobody accepts them except those 20,000 foreign Muslims and all the other people. But anyway, there's no caliph, so old jihad can only be defensive. And that means if you watch old Osama bin Laden videos or uh, read any jihad literature, they're always listing all these grievances. They're always whining. 
They're always complaining. These guys are the biggest crybabies on earth, and they're saying, you, you did this to us, and you did that to us, and we did, you did this, and Israel, and Iraq, and, 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 and they have to strike back. But the point is, is that they are situating themselves theologically within Islam as, as fighting a defensive jihad. They have to, because offensive jihad can't be fought without a caliph. The goal of all the jihad groups in the world is to reestablish the caliphate. Al-Qaeda doesn't like the Islamic State because Al-Qaeda wanted to start a caliphate. And the Islamic State stole their thunder. Muslim Brotherhood doesn't like the, calif the Islamic State because they wanted to start their own caliphate. And the Islamic State stole their thunder. But the caliphate itself has an idea. That's what they all want. So Barack Obama, I think, he thought he would give it to them, not this one, but the one that the Muslim Brotherhood wanted. And that's why he was so favorable to Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And he figured they'll, uh, they'll get together with Libya and Syria and start a caliphate, and then they won't have any more grievances. And they'll go away and there'll be peace. It's based on a fundamental misunderstanding of Islamic theology, but we are in an era of fantasy-based policymaking where whole, uh, the, the, virtually the entire apparatus of American foreign and domestic policy is based on false assumptions. Anyway, so the situation, given all this, is indeed dire, and I can't sugarcoat it. We have to know where we are in order to get where we need to be. We can't pretend otherwise. People always say, can't you end on a note of hope? And I said, well, if there were any, I would, but there is. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there is. And that is that the truth will always out. That they can't help it. They, it, it Solzhenitsyn used to call it blades of grass through the concrete. You can put concrete over the grass, but the grass will always spring up in it and, and break up the concrete, even though the grass is weak and the concrete has all the power. We are facing a situation where the government, the media, the educational system, the entertainment industry, all our leaders, they're all clueless or complicit or both. The only thing we have is the truth. They have to keep pouring on the fog of disinformation. As I said, they have to keep churning out all these false articles about how the Islamic State is not Islamic because people do know and they are waking up. And we can turn this around because the truth cannot be hidden. And ultimately, it's really a very easy thing. If we start demanding from our elected officials and potential elected officials that they speak the truth about this and not accepting them, not doing so, we could turn this around really quite quickly. I mentioned the Berlin Wall in passing a while ago. And remember what a shock that was. You know, right, probably a year before that, or two or three years before that, there were still people saying in the Western media, well, you know, the Soviet Union will be dealing with them for centuries to come. And we're just going to have to settle in for the long haul here. And then it came down so suddenly. Why? Because it was built on lies. And this culture, this cult of death and destruction that loves death and loves hatred and loves to destroy is also built on lies. And so it cannot possibly win as long as we have the courage to stand for the truth. Thank you. at this time. What you should do is uh, point out that in Britain there are 75 Sharia courts now and they've only been operating for a few years at least legally and a few years ago, 2010 thereabouts, when they were established, many many people in the British government assured us that there would be, they would have nothing to do with uh, Cases where Islamic law and British criminal law contradicted each other. But those cases would be referred to the criminal courts. Most notably, you're talking about spousal abuse. Because the Quran says good women are obedient, as for those that are not, give them a warning, send them to separate beds, and beat them. Uh, that's chapter 4, verse 34. And so, when a woman would go to a Sharia court and say, my husband beat me, they would say, well, you better redouble your efforts to please him. If she, of course, goes to the criminal court, then they're criminal proceedings. So those cases should have been, and we were, would be, referred to the British criminal courts. They were not. 
the Islamic uh, courts dealt with many cases like that. Many women, therefore, were uh, treated unjustly. And nothing has been done about it. The promises were broken, and it was pretty much inevitable that they would be. But you can point out that Islam is, Sharia is an all-encompassing system of laws. There is no distinction between the parts of Sharia that have to do with waging war against and subjugating unbelievers, and the parts that they claim they're only going to be dealing with, like marriages and funerals and such. And that once you open the door to the one, you're opening the door to the other. And the assurances that there would be some sort of a wall built up between the aspects of Sharia that are compatible with American law, with, with Western law, and the aspects that are not, this no wall was created and there was no uh, attempt to honor American law or Western law at all. And so why will it be different in Texas? It won't be. You can also point out that there, were, there was an attempt to bring Sharia courts to Canada that was defeated by a group of Muslim women who knew what Sharia was all about. <laughs> And they came to Canada to get away from it. And all these things, you know, you can find online very easily. Lewis, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, my question is in regards to the poor, uneducated Muslims that are converting to violence because of their financial and uh, yeah. status. What is the financial status of ISIS? The uh, Islamic State is the richest terrorist group in the world. They overran quite a few oil wells. As I said, they control an area larger than Great Britain. And they have about 60 oil wells. And uh, last report, they were getting $3 million a day selling oil. The uh, Obama administration sent John Kerry to Turkey to ask the Turks to stop the Islamic State from selling oil. And the Islamic State, uh, the Turks said no. Because, see, that's another one. There's so many people who want a caliphate. Uh, the, another key person in the Islamic world who wants to restore the caliphate is Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey. And he, of course, Turkey was the site of the last caliphate, the one that was abolished in 1924. He wants to start it again. He's not a fan of the Islamic State, but I think he thinks he can use it for his own ends. That they can fight his enemies, the Kurds and others, that he hates, and then he can go in and take advantage of what they've done. So he's not going to stop them from doing anything. So in other words, yes, they're very wealthy. Also, survey after survey has shown that jihad terrorists are generally wealthier and better educated than their peers. And so also there is just a commonsensical thing about this. It's been widely ridiculed, of course, you know, just give them jobs. But think about it. <laughs> think about it. That here's some, some guy who thinks that he is serving God. And, some, and he thinks that he is a noble warrior for the noblest cause on earth. And the U.S. State Department actually thinks he's going to give that up for a chance to say, you want fries with that? <laughs> The, the, the idiocy is mind-boggling, and yet these are the people who are in charge, who are making policy. Yes, sir. Okay. If they only have 60 oil wells that they're, that they're surviving on, why do we bomb their 60 oil wells? Good question. Address it to uh, Barack H. Obama, 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. No, seriously, that's a very good question and a very good point. And why has it not been done? I think that because Obama does not really want to do what needs to be done to stop these people. He thinks that uh, it seems clear whether or not he himself is a Muslim that he thinks Islam is great and good for people. And he certainly aided and abetted its spread in advance in the United States and elsewhere. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, what are your thoughts on uh, the Egyptian president Sisi and even the king of Jordan? I know. The Egyptian president spoke out about early this year uh, to a bunch of eons to, we need reformation, this jihad has got to be cut out. And the other day I read something about, he shut down 27,000 mosques in Egypt. What are your thoughts? That seems somewhat hopeful. Yeah, he did. The, the uh, president of Egypt, Assisi, he shut down 27,000 mosques. King Abdullah of Jordan has spoken out against the Islamic State, so has Assisi. Assisi called for reform in Islam. Uh, these are all good things. You have to understand that uh, Assisi, like Mubarak and Sadat and Nasser in Egypt, 
and like Saddam Hussein, and like the Assads in Syria, and Ben Ali in Tunisia, some others, they were Arab nationalists. And the Arab nationalist movement was a secular movement. It used to be, up until like 20 years ago, even maybe even 10 years ago, it was the most significant political force in the, in the in not in the whole Islamic world, but in the Arab world. The idea of a secular Western government, essentially, with some aspects of Islamic law, but not all of Islamic law implemented. And this was all over the Middle East. Those guys were beasts, but they kept stability in the region such that we wish we had there now. Yes. Uh, in the name of democracy, we aided and abetted the taking out of many of those regimes. And there, it was inevitable that if you went for a one-man, one-vote system, that then there would be put in Islamic regimes in these areas. And these, of course, are operating according to Islamic principles and wanting to reestablish Islamic law in those countries. Islamic law is not in force in full in Egypt, or it hadn't been in Iraq, and in Syria it's not, and so on. And so you have these people in a peculiar position because Abdullah, of course, in Jordan, he's a Muslim. But he's not really a hardline by the book guy. He's a Muslim culturally. He's a Muslim because this is the what he has to be if he wants to be king of Jordan. <laughs> and Al Sisi is the same way. They do not, you know, I can quote the book to them all day long and they'll say, yeah, it's in there and I'm not doing it. There's a spectrum of belief and knowledge and fervor among all people in all religions, and these guys are not hardline believers. And so they want to, the big weakness of uh, the Arab nationalist movement was that it was made up primarily of Muslims, but it did not have some alternate version of Islam that said we shouldn't wage war against unbelievers. There is no form of Islam that doesn't teach that. So that put them in a bad position. They are trying, he called for, or Sisi called for, the creation of that kind of Islam. And what's significant is that none of the clerics to whom he was speaking at Al-Azhar in Cairo uh, heeded the call or said, yes, we're going to do that. We're going to work on reevaluating and reforming all this. And that was to be expected because they know it's in the book. And it was, in other words, it was good that he said it, but not really all that great. It's not going to change anything. Yes, sir. Uh, your argument about 9-11 uh, being an internal war or a Muslim war. Do you mean, do I think the Muslims took down the towers, or did yes. George Bush took take down the towers, or some <laughs> nefarious scheme to get us involved in a war for Israel? No, I believe the Muslims took down the towers. The uh, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the, the uh, leading mastermind of the plot, has freely acknowledged that they cooked, this, cooked up this plot and so on. I don't think he's a CIA mole. Uh, the, the idea of a president of the United States committing an act of treason on that scale it just, uh, and also, you know what else, just as a common sense thing, a conspiracy like that would have to involve, of necessity, hundreds if not thousands of people. Somebody's going to talk. But anyway, I think that uh, there's plenty of motive, plenty of wherewithal, plenty of money, the will, the power, the, the desire to do it, all among Muslims. Why, why uh, try to make up anything else? Yes, sir. Be a tough question, you probably answered it before, but we talk about, with all due respect, God being a loving God, being God, etc., different from Allah in a sense. Yeah. Uh, how do you answer those critics who say, look at the Old Testament where God commanded to Israel to go in and wipe out all the people, especially the book of Joshua and all that kind of thing? Absolutely. Uh, there are passages that are violent in the Old Testament. There is never a passage that is violent in the Old Testament that tells people to go out and imitate this. In other words, the passages that are violent in the Jewish scriptures say they describe various things. And it's extremely problematic for both Jewish and Christian exegetes, those who are explaining the, the scriptures. It's very problematic and difficult for them because what they are most all unanimously intent on doing is not taking a literal understanding of these passages and emphasizing that they do not apply to all people in all times and places, that they should be allegorized, understood in a spiritual way, something of various ways to emphasize that they describe certain events, but there is no imitative, uh, imitative quality to 
these descriptions. In other words, they don't say, Joshua emptied out a whole city, therefore you go and empty out a city. And no Jews or Christians have ever committed acts of violence and said, we are doing this in imitation of uh, Joshua or something written in Deuteronomy or whatever. And so that is very different from what's in the Quran, which is prescriptive, not descriptive. It is prescribing behavior and saying, the, you should wage war against and subjugate unbelievers. This is addressed to all believers for all unbelievers. It is for all time. There is no passage like that in the Jewish or Christian scriptures. And so there's really no uh, comparison between the two. Uh, there is no imperative in any form of Judaism or Christianity. There is no theological imperative to wage war against and subjugate unbelievers. And then you can say, oh, but what about the Crusades and so on? The Crusades did not proceed according to some sort of a doctrinal or scriptural imperative. They were a late and a defensive reaction to try to protect the Holy Land after 450 years of jihad conquest had conquered over half of the Christian world. And after the uh, Caliph al-Hakim in the Holy Land had destroyed 300,000 churches and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And they, the Byzantine Emperor had lost a major battle at Manticore in 1071, lost all of Asia Minor, what is now Turkey, to, to the Ottomans. And he appealed to help to the Pope. This was what made for the Crusades, in other words. It wasn't them saying, we read in the Bible that we should kill and conquer, and therefore we're going to kill and conquer. The Bible doesn't say that, and they weren't doing it. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the major difference between the Shiites and the Sunnis, and, and why do they seem to hate each other almost as much as they hate us? Well, they hate each other almost as much as they hate us because they are told that apostates and heretics should be killed. Um, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 89 of the Quran. Open your Qurans to chapter 4, verse 89. <laughs> It says, <clears throat> they wish that you would disbelieve just as they disbelieve, so that you may be all alike. Do not, therefore, take allies from them until they emigrate in the way of Allah, which means become Muslim, like Muhammad emigrated from Mecca to Medina and became the leader of a community, the leader of a military political force for the first time, and emigration became this holy thing in Islam. So they emigrate in the way of Allah. Then they're okay. But if they turn their backs, seize them and slay them wherever you find them. Take none of them for your ally or helper. So he's say, they say if you have people who become Muslims and then they leave, go and kill them. The idea that both the Sunnis and the Shiites have is that the other group has done that. It started as just a uh, dynastic dispute. Uh, according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad died suddenly in the year 632. According to the Shiites, he appointed his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, to be the head of the Muslim community. According to the Sunnis, he did not. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been fighting about that ever since. Yes, sir. Yeah, he might not know that. And this is why. The Quran is in Arabic. This is not actually the Quran, I lied. I said this was the Quran. It's an English Quran. In Islamic theology, the Quran has to be in Arabic. If it's not in Arabic, it's not the Quran. This is just the meaning of the Quran. Now, the meaning of the Quran is all we need to understand it. But for a believing Muslim, He's got to recite the Quran in Arabic. If you were, and I do not advise this, but if you were to convert to Islam tomorrow, <laughs> then you would have to pray in Arabic. So you've got to learn some Arabic. Now, it's a lot easier to learn to mouth syllables than to learn a whole language. And so most Muslims today are not Arabs. Most Muslims around the world today do not speak Arabic. And so when they learn, like in the Pakistani madrasas, when they go in and they learn, they memorize the Quran. These five, ten-year-old boys. <laughs> They memorize the whole thing, but they have no idea what it's all about. But they actually have, a few years back, I was talking to a Pakistani Muslim, and he said, I'm very proud of my own religion. 
And I have memorized almost all of the Quran. And one day I'm going to get one of those translations and find out what it says. <laughs> he had memorized a lot of Arabic without knowing Arabic. And it is possible, indeed likely, that Obama in Quran class memorized some Arabic. And that he, I don't think he speaks Arabic. He might. And he might know what it means. But he, it's not an open and shut case that because he went to Quran school, he would know all of Islamic doctrine because Islam is highly ceremonial. All you have to do is recite the prayers in Arabic. You don't have to have any idea what you're saying. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned um, a particular version here of someone writing this particular Quran. Are there different versions that are interpreted different ways? There's only one Quran in Arabic. There are some minor variations. The Shiites have a couple of chapters. They say they don't, but they do. They have a couple of chapters that the Sunnis don't have, but there's nothing much interesting in them. And uh, there are some variants among the, 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 there's a manuscript tradition in Africa that's different from the one that most Qurans come from. It's just a few minor differences of wording, but mostly it's all the same Arabic Quran. There are a lot of different English translations, and some of them, they all have their weaknesses, and they all have their strengths. I have 21 English translations of the Quran in my office. You know, a little lightning. And uh, they, mostly they're pretty much the same, but sometimes one of them will bring out the meaning of a passage in a way that another one obscures it. There's a lot of Quran translations that obscure the meanings. Most, the most popular ones are written in this pseudo-King James Bible language with these and thous. And I think it's deliberately designed to obfuscate the meaning so that people read things and they fly right by them and they don't realize what they're reading. Thank you. Yes, sir. We who are Christians, we have the New Testament. We have snippets of the New Testament that go back to the first century. So we have about 24,000 manuscripts that predate the printing press. So we have a lot of validity for the New Testament that we have. What kind of validity is there for the Quran? What's the earliest copy of the Quran? And how many years does that come after the death of Muhammad? This is where it gets really weird. <laughs> I told you before that, there, that the Arab armies came out of Arabia in the 630s, and by the 690s they conquered all across the Middle East, all across North Africa, in Persia, and so on. And yet, there is no mention of Muhammad, the Quran, Islam, Muslims, nothing, from any of the writings of the people at that time. And the standard story is, in Islamic tradition, that the Caliph Uthman, the third successor of Muhammad, he, in 653, the year 653, gathered together everybody who had memorized parts of the Quran, and he got them to write it all down, burned all the variants, and distributed copies of the Quran to the provinces. However, there is no manuscript from the 650s. The, uh, weird thing is, is that even after that happened, there's no mention of the Quran from anyone. We don't hear any mention of the Quran for another 40 years. And so it seems unlikely that it actually did exist at that time. And then in the 690s, is when we start hearing about the Quran and Islam and Muhammad, for the very first time, the Caliph was Abdul Malik. And Abdul Malik says a very strange thing in one tradition. He says, I'm afraid I'm going to die during Ramadan because I was born during Ramadan, I became caliph during Ramadan, I collected and codified the Quran during Ramadan, <laughs> and so I'm afraid I'm going to die during Ramadan. Now let me ask you this, why would anybody, if they had the Quran laying around for 40 years since Uthman, who distributed it to all the provinces, remember, why would anybody say that they had done it 40 years later? But if he did it 40 years later, then it would make perfect sense for him to say, no, no, this isn't anything new. I got this from Uthman. What, you didn't get one? Oh, here you go. <laughs> and of course, there's no internet. They can't go and look on Wikipedia and see if they really had this 40 years ago. <laughs> and so he, he, he gives some, an air of authenticity to what he's done by casting it back into the past. But the short answer is, there are no early manuscripts. There was actually recently an early manuscript that was discovered, and there was some publicity about it, that it was dated from the 650s or 660s. And so I saw that come along and I, and I thought, oh, well, there goes my book and my theory and, you know, that's it. I'll, 
take out the saxophone. But <laughs> then I looked at the, the, there was a full PDF of all the manuscripts, and it was fascinating because this is supposed to be the earliest manuscript of the Quran. In the first place, there's considerable evidence that the Quran was made up from material from other sources, and so it could be from one of those sources. In the second place, you look at it, and there's stuff that's erased and written over. Very good sign of things that might be written by committee, cobbled <laughs> together. And so that's the situation with the Quran. We don't start hearing about it as such until the early 8th century. Way in the back, you've been very patient. Thank you. Uh, theologically speaking, uh, when you were studying the Quran, do you get the feeling that you're reading actually two separate religions, two separate scriptures with two separate deities? Well, I can't say as I ever have, actually. No, what, what do you mean? Uh, the verses that are attributed <coughs> um, to a particular philosophy that is tolerant, and it is very different from the other verses that are not aggregated, which are fire. Yeah, I see what you mean. Actually, there is a big difference in the Quran between, if you, if you get a Quran, even in English, you can tell this. The... Uh, Chapters from about 87 to, to the end, 114, are very brief, very poetic, with these arresting images. Just a few lines. The earlier parts of the book, which actually come later, according to Islamic tradition, those are the Medinan verses that were uh, revealed later, excuse me, in Muhammad's career, are long and ponderous and uh, not in the least poetic. Uh, they have a certain rhythm in Arabic, but nothing like the poetic character of the earlier parts. And so, yeah, I see your point there. That uh, I think that what we have here is a book, as I said, made by committee, and various source materials were put, were drawn from and put together. And so, people explain, you know, Muhammad evolved in his poetic, in his uh, prophetic career, and his first. Revelations are very short and poetic, but as he became a military and political leader, he had to issue directions for the ordering of the society, and so they became long and ponderous. That's the traditional view. My view is they took some bits from here and bits from there and put it together to create a holy book. Um, even the word recitation, Quran, is the name of a lectionary. You know, uh, there's still lectionaries in the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. The book where the readings are all uh, put together. It's not the Old Testament or the New Testament as such, but just a series of the readings for every day that will come up in the liturgy or the Mass or what have you. And uh, some people have posited that the Quran is a lectionary like that, that was actually a uh, Christian text combined with some other Jewish texts, and that's why it flits from subject to subject and doesn't have any logical or coherent ordering, because it was a lectionary for different dates and you know if you try to pick up the book that's in the church and read it through and think well I just don't see the narrative flow in this well it's because that's not how it's organized. Anyway, yes? Yeah, just to, I think pretty much uh, support what you just said. Um, the primarily from Judaism and Christianity, but it's, uh, it's drawn from many different sources. I go through this in, in my book, Did Muhammad Exist? A lot of the things, some things, even the, the paradise with the virgins comes from uh, Zoroastrianism, although they don't have the same kind of lurid whorehouse paradise that <laughs> Nonetheless, it's, uh, and, and so there, there are just a lot of different things drawn upon. But yeah, it is, it does come from many sources, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, 
oppose ISIS, is there some moderation in lobbyism or the purely practical thing that they just want to get this out of the way? The Saudis are opposing ISIS, is that what you said? Right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The Saudis, it's, it's sort of sweet uh, revenge in a certain <laughs> sense. It's kind of um, poetic justice is the word I was looking for. The Saudis are responsible for ISIS. They created it. They didn't create it organizationally. They created it ideologically. In, in many parts of the world, partly because of the language thing that I explained about how most of the Muslims are just reciting stuff in Arabic without necessarily knowing what it means, and partly because of various cultural factors, colonialism, various other things, in East Africa, Central Asia, other parts of the world, there had developed, by the beginning of the 20th century, a form of cultural Islam that was really rather benign, not completely benign, but it certainly did not emphasize jihad and subjugation of infidels. Then came the Saudis striking oil. And these guys with untold billions of dollars. And what do they do? They give billions of dollars to spreading Islam around the world. Their understanding of Islam, which is Wahhabism. Wahhabism was Islamic reform. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab died in 1792. So he was roughly a, a contemporary of George Washington. And he taught that the this Islamic establishment of the Ottoman Empire, the Caliph, had grown corrupt and strayed from Islam. And so he was going to get back to the basics, to original Islam. The Quran, the Hadith, nothing else, and absolutely, literally interpret these in the way that they were intended. And he, that's Wahhabism. And they spent billions spreading that around the world, saying the only legitimate government is a caliphate. Now they've got a caliphate right next door, saying, yeah, that means your government is not legitimate. It's, it's just kind of sweet, really. But um, they did it. And so they opposed the Islamic State because they're threatened by it. No theological grounds whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they created it. They didn't create the theological grounds, but they emphasized and spread everywhere the understanding of those theological grounds that made for the creation of the Islamic State. Uh, let's see. Yes, sir. What do you say to the incoherent view that we get in this country that Islam is peaceful, but then when pushed, you hear people say, well, we need to help reform it because there's so many moderate Muslims. Well, there are plenty of moderate Muslims. The question is, what is a moderate Muslim? The United States government thinks that you're a moderate Muslim if you're not strapping on a bomb vest. But the idea is, the assumption that they have is that a moderate Muslim is somebody who thinks we shouldn't wage war against unbelievers. We shouldn't conquer non-Muslim states and Islamize them. There are no moderate Muslims like that. There might be some who think that we shouldn't do it, but if they are aware of what's in the Quran, they're not going to stand up to those who are fighting against or battles. They're not going to stand up because they know what's in the Quran. There are people who are identified as Muslims who are ignorant of what's in the Quran, and so they're not fighting to conquer us because they don't know what's in there. But when the conflict worsens, will they side with us? Unlikely. They'll probably side with the Muslims because they identify themselves as such. There are Muslims who just can't be bothered, who are just like anybody else, you know, nominal Christians, and people who are of any religion but just aren't that into it. And there are Muslims who are like that, that really just rather work their jobs and have a family. You know, human nature is everywhere the same. Muslims aren't any different from anybody else. So there are Muslims who just don't care. They know that's in there, but they don't care. If you really want reformers who say we have to reject Muhammad as an example and reform the violent passages of the Quran, evolve a new understanding of them that mitigates their capacity to incite people to violence, Zuni Jasser, <laughs> um, Asra Namani, you know, maybe five of them. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think of our current <laughs> Well, on October 19, 2011, 57 Muslim organizations, Muslim South Asian and Arab uh, organizations, wrote to John Brennan. He was then in Homeland Security. He was now, the, of course, the CIA director. And they demanded that I be fired from training FBI agents and demanded that all 
counter-terror training materials be scrubbed of any mention of jihad and Islam in connection with terrorism. Brennan wrote back on White House stationery. Do you think he ran out of paper and went to the Oval Office and said, hey, Barack, can I borrow a piece of paper? No, he was emphasizing that this was from the top. This was the highest level. And he said, absolutely, we're going to comply. We will not only comply, we will re-educate any of the agents who have been trained by these Islamophobes or these Islamophobic materials. And so ever since October 19th, 2011, or whenever it was that Brennan answered shortly after that, if you're in the FBI, if you're in the CIA, if you're in Homeland Security, you're not allowed, you're forbidden as a matter of policy to understand the motives and goals of the enemy. And you might, you know, it's not that dire because I know there are plenty of agents who go out on their own and they find out and they study up. But if you're in the agency and you're going to get in a speaker who's going to tell you about Islam, you might, but he'll tell you all about how it's peace. <laughs> and that's Brennan. But it's really Obama. And of course then there are the rumors, and I don't really think they're rumors. I think it's, it's pretty much open and shut, and I tell you that because when I used to train FBI agents, I was brought in by an agent, John Guandolo, who you may have heard of. John Guandolo has left the Bureau, but he says that when he was there, it was an open, it was open knowledge. It was, I, I was going to say an open secret, but it wasn't really in any sense a secret. Everybody knew that when Brennan had served in Saudi Arabia, he had converted to Islam. And that he was a practicing Muslim now. And that the, uh, there was a big New Yorker piece about the, one of the leaders of our counterterrorism uh, strategy efforts was a Muslim. And the, the, he was not named in that piece, but that it was Brennan. And I have no reason to think John Guandolo, I know John Guandolo, John Guandolo is a friend of mine, and you're no, no sorry. John Guandolo, I don't think he would be lying about that. I just don't see him as that kind of guy. It ain't there. Yeah. Did you see the movie? I think it was Zero Dark Thirty. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, Brennan's in there as a Muslim. I mean, it's clearly Brennan, and he's clearly a Muslim. He, the guy, somebody, one of those agents, goes into his office, and he's getting up from his prayer, prayer rug. Yeah. You know, his prayer rug. Uh, and then I, I mention that it's just a movie, but I mention that because remember the Obama administration got in some trouble for uh, leaking classified information to those movie makers, yeah. and so. For them to have a very high-level counterintelligence, counter-terror guy to be a Muslim, you know, I think they know something. Yeah. Yes, sir. How about uh, Valerie Jarrett? Was she, she born in Iran? Is she a Muslim? As far as I know, she was born in Iran, and, and that's where it stops, you know. This is another one of these mysterious people in the Obama administration about which we know so little. Definitely communists. Well, all the people around him are communists, yeah. you know, and he's a communist. But communism and Islam, people might say, you know, people often do say, how is it that these, uh, how can communism and Islam be compatible? It, look, they're eminently compatible. And they never had any trouble in the, in, in, you know, Christians were persecuted in the Soviet Union, Jews were persecuted in the Soviet Union, the Muslims not so much in uh, the, the Soviet republics that are now independent countries, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, I think out Turkmenistan and, uh, and my uncle Stan. Um, but anyway, it's because they both have a totalitarian, authoritarian worldview. And I think this is why the left and Islam gets along so well together. They both want to silence dissent. You know, leftists will never discuss, never debate. They just want to shut you down. And, of course, Islam forbids criticism of Islam. And the... Uh, idea of a reign of terror. Every time communists have come into power, there was a reign of terror. In other words, they would kill a lot of people to serve as an example for the, both those who they didn't kill, that they better not get out of line. Same thing in Islam. It's a slow motion reign of terror. Sharia is a reign of terror. 
you know, stonings and amputations and all that, it keeps people in fear all the time so they won't get out of line. It's the same thing. So I think they're kind of blood brothers, really. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Some of that uh, dissent that you say is <clears throat> trying to be dismissed, I, I like to call it uh, the acceptance of uh, the twist of perversity of political correctness. Yeah. It's, it's, so part of our, it's part of our culture now. Mm -hmm. I mean, workplace violence and for good and, and ISIS are not terrorists. I mean, is this to protect us from uh, going another full blown uh, crusades? Or is that the bottom line or what? I think that the idea is to intimidate people into thinking that there's something wrong with resisting jihad terror. Mm -hmm. And that's the work of people who obviously want jihad terror to succeed. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I'm not, uh, I, you know, I don't really know what is behind all this. I think Barack, Barack Obama probably thinks that he really will bring, around peace, bring about peace in the world by granting them all their grievances. Mm -hmm. um, but the political correctness, when you talk about that, and the denial, the willful ignorance about all this, it's deadly. You know, it's not just that people are afraid to talk about this in, 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 in an honest fashion. It's not just that our political leaders are afraid to name the enemy. It's that the refusal to name the enemy has become, as you pointed out, a culture-wide phenomenon. And people are afraid to even discuss it honestly, and that is deadly. I'll give you an example. Did you, do you remember the Fort Dix plot? It was not Fort Hood, but Fort Dix. Mm -hmm. uh, in New Jersey, isn't it? And there were these uh, six Albanian Muslims. Remember that they're Albanian, because it's important later. And they were going to drive into Fort Dix and shoot as many American soldiers as possible and then get shot and go and have the virgins. The plot was foiled. How was it foiled? There was, they, they had all these gory jihad videos blood, beheadings, gore, explosions. They loved all that stuff, but they had it on VHS tapes. So they took it to a video store, and there's this 17-year-old kid behind the counter, and they say, will you convert these to DVD for us? And he said, okay, you know, he's there working, and he's seeing all this horrible stuff go by, and he realizes that something may be up here. So he goes to his manager, and he said, you know how these kids today are. He said, dude, I'm seeing some really weird shit on these videos. Should I go to the police? Or would that be racist? Should I go to the police? Or would that be racist? Remember, they were Albanians. They were all white guys. But anyway, he had internalized the idea that it would be racist to resist jihad terror. And he was 17. He, he wasn't reading the, the newspapers or watching the news. He had just breathed this in with the cultural air. Luckily, he decided to be racist in the plot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Well, the thing about it is, is that it's never been spoken about about at all. The people in this room have heard about it because they have heard John Bongolo say it somewhere, or heard me say it somewhere, or heard somebody else repeating John Bongolo or me. But it has never been on like ABC or CBS or NBC. No reporter has ever gone up to Brennan and said, do you have any comment about this? It just lays there un undealt with. And this is what always happens, you know? These people don't feel as if they have any accountability. They don't have to address these things. And you know, it doesn't really matter. If you're right, if John Brennan's a Muslim, depending on what that inf does to his ideas of what ought to be done about the jihad terror threat, and Brennan has said, he's on record many times, saying jihad is benign, it's the struggle in the soul to better yourself, and jihad is a wonderful thing. 
The problem is when we have terrorists who are saying they're waging jihad, he is hampering, he is hindering our ability to understand the enemy and to formulate ways to counter his ideology when he says that. And that's why it matters. It's never over till it's over. 
And as long as there are free people standing, then I'll be standing with them, and I hope you will be too. And like I say, the Berlin Wall shows us things can turn around quickly. But right now, we are not at that turnaround. And I don't see it coming. Nobody saw the Berlin Wall coming either. I think lies and empires of lies like that can and do fall very quickly. And so I, I actually am confident that that can happen. But it's not happening. What I see is with the increased immigration, with the poorest borders, with the efforts by Muslim groups to shut down counter-terror efforts because they're Islamophobic. The New York City cops had a, a, a program of surveillance of mosques that was shut down under pressure from Muslim organizations who were allied with the new mayor. I mean, how long can we just keep doing things like that and think nothing's going to happen? Yes, sir. I, I, I just see all the irony. Number one, after 9-11, when you were working with uh, education of the feds, did you ever work with uh, Michael Resnick, uh, training the FBI, tearing down the walls? They named the, and this is what I think is ironic, is they named the new anti-terrorism center in D.C. after him, after his death, and yet they've gone and disassembled. He tore down Jamie, Jamie Durell's, Durell's wall. Well, from what I understand, that's back up. The agencies don't share all this information. Mm -hmm. We've had the federal agent, former federal agents here talking to us that, like you said, don't know, didn't know about jihad. Yeah, they don't. And the goals. So it's all been disassembled, and yet we built an anti-terrorism center in D.C. It's like it's an oxymoron. The National Counterterrorism Center? Yeah. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, it's the Michael Resnick. Yeah, I spoke uh, to a group there. If I recall correctly, I might be conflating two different things, but I think that I went there with Steve Emerson, and uh, we did an all-day seminar. He did four hours in the morning, and I did four hours in the afternoon. And it was a mix of FBI and CIA agents. And the first question from these guys was, you know, you guys keep bragging on CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. I depend on those guys. How can we be, have such a negative view of them? That's where we are. And that was like eight years ago. Wow. So who do they study in that center? They study people that the uh, groups like CARE tell them to study. So they say, you want to know about Islam, go to John Esposito, who is a Saudi-funded academic, who wrote a book called The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality? And his answer is, of course, myth. And so they are, in other words, completely uneducated and miseducated about the threat. Yes, sir. Uh, Obama is supposed to bring in 2,000 Syrian refugees. What's the chance that El not El IS is going to infiltrate as many IS people into that 2,000 group? Well, I think about 100 percent. I mean, if you were there, <laughs> wouldn't you try? That's you know? my opinion, also. I mean. It's just common sense, you know. They have an opportunity, they take it. They're not dumbass. Yes, sir. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen yeah. to Israel or Iran? Israel and Iran. Uh, no doubt that these many genocidal statements from Iran, from many different people, indicate that if they get a bomb, they'll use it. And you have to understand Shiite eschatology. The Sunni Shiite split. Didn't you ask me about the Sunni Shiite split? Okay. I knew it was from around here. The Sunni Shiite split is on the basis of who gets to lead the Muslims. And the Sunni idea is it's the best man from the community who's called the successor or caliph. The Shiite idea is that it is the Imam. In Sunni Islam, the Imam is like your local rabbi or local parish priest. He's the guy down at the local mosque. But in Shiite Islam, the Imam is the successor of Muhammad who has some of his prophetic character. He's infallible and he is uh, almost a quasi-new prophet himself. And he has to be a member of Muhammad's household. He has to be a relative. So there was Ali and then there were 11 more and then the 12th one. Because he has to be a member of Muhammad's household, it becomes like a hereditary dynasty, like a kingdom. And so the 12th one was five years old. 
in the year 874, he fell down well and died. But in the Shiite view, he didn't die, he's in the well. And he's hidden. And he's going to come out when the Muslims are persecuted more ferociously than they've ever been persecuted before. Now, there have been mullahs in Iran who have said that they understand that to mean if the Muslims are persecuted more ferociously than they've ever been persecuted before, they can bring on the persecution of the Muslims by, they send a nuke to Tel Aviv, six million people are killed, and Israel is destroyed. Israel or America or both retaliates, 10, 15 million Iranians are killed, the Muslims are persecuted worse than ever before, but the Iranians can sustain that. And the 12th Imam will come out of the well and conquer and Islamize the world. So there's a no-lose situation again. I think we have time for one more question, please. Any more? I can give a comment. I know this may not be popular, but uh, I think we got a defensive strategy here, and I'm going to quote George Patton, the best defense is a good offense. We got the gospel. Just preach Jesus wherever they're at. I've got a lot of Muslim students in front of me every day. A lot of them don't seem to have any idea of what you're talking about. They're just... They don't. Because, as I they're explained, perfect to talk to. to they a, ask questions. And, yeah, I'm going to preach to them. They're not my heartbeat. The, the Chinese are. But I would just say, preach the gospel and don't worry about what happens. So, yeah. you my thoughts on that. Well, the thing is, of course, if we think about a billion Muslims, a billion three, a billion six, I think probably a billion is a more likely number. But in any case, it's unlikely that they're all going to convert oh, to anything else. <laughs> and obviously, a large-scale war would be catastrophic for humanity. But I think that, above all, we do have to stand for our own values, as I was explaining in the talk that when the British Empire was strong enough to say, yeah, follow your culture, and we'll follow ours and hang you for following yours, then these, the, 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 the Hindus stopped doing the sati. And if we were to stand in the Muslim countries and say, anybody who is, wants to leave Islam and wants protection from anybody who wants to kill you, come, we'll give you safe harbor. And anybody who is beaten in your home and you want to get away from the husband who beats you, come here and we'll give you safe harbor. And we stand for freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, equality of rights of all people before the law, women as well as men, non-Muslims as well as non-Muslims. I think we'd have a lot of people in those countries who would join us because human nature is everywhere the same. And there are a lot of people who would say they would much rather live under such a system than under Islamic law. Isn't that why we went to Iraq and let them know? What's that? That's why we went to Iraq. No, it isn't. We installed Sharia in Iraq. We never said we would protect apostates from Islam. We never said we would protect women who were threatened. Never stood up for our own principles at all. That's what I'm saying we got to do. Thank you.